the future plans of Russia. Now, friends, at the outset, we wish to say that as Christadelphians, we have no political allegiances. We're not involved in the politics of this world, but we are immensely interested in them because the events that take place in the world around us are the work of Almighty God who rules in the kingdoms of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. And perhaps we'll begin our consideration by having a look at that quote. It's in Daniel chapter 4, where the prophet Daniel, in Daniel chapter 4, actually said to the greatest monarch of the world at that time, he told him in Daniel chapter 4 and verse 17, he says, The Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basest of men. And friends, it's very interesting that over the past year or so, there have been a number of political elections with outcomes that were not expected. We could quote Brexit, and Christadelphians expected that Britain would depart from the European Union because of their understanding of the Bible. So much so that when they went in, they said they wouldn't go in. They were before their time. Come to the, to the presidential election. It wasn't the result that was expected. We've got an election taking place in France. It's already not the result that was expected. There's going to be significant changes in France, they suggest, as a result of this election. It's a demonstration, friends, that the most high God rules in the kingdoms of men. You should be able to, with democracy, take an exit poll and you have an idea what's going to happen. Well, they did, and it didn't turn out with Brexit or with, with uh, the presidential election in the United States. So much so that Australia got caught napping, as we know that in the, our, our own government didn't even have a number for Donald Trump so they could ring up and congratulate. That was the situation. You see, friends, as Christadelphians, we have been interested in the movements of Russia for more than 100 years, ever since we were known as Christadelphians. Because we have seen the movements of Russia as signs of the time, signs of the telling us that the return of Christ is near. And one eminent Christadelphian more than 150 years ago said that the movements of Russia are signs of the times. When Russia makes his grand move for the building up of his image empire, then let the reader know that the things as present, con presently constituted are about to come to an end. That's in a book called Elvis Israel in 1849. And so when, what we're about to tell you is not something I made up last week. It's something that I've actually delivered as a public lecture many times and that my father delivered as public lectures many times and go back years before that many Christadelphians have in the past. We're not going to tell you anything new. What's new, friends, is that Russia is beginning to make many of those moves that we as Christadelphians have expected for many years. All right, let's have a look, friends, and uh, just a brief outline of what we're going to look at over the course of the next few minutes. We're going to see Russia in the Bible. We're going to see where it's spoken of in the Bible. We're going to see who the allies of Russia will be when they come down upon the mountains of Israel, as we read in Ezekiel chapter 38, and they are destroyed when Almighty God intervenes. Because if you come back to Ezekiel chapter 38, let's just have a look what happens when this great confederacy of nations or this group of nations comes down into the land of Israel. You see, God says concerning Israel that they are the apple of my eye, the most sensitive part of the body. You don't poke someone in the apple of their eye without a severe reaction. And that's what, how God regards touching Israel. It's like poking God in the eye. 
And beware, anyone that does that will cop it. History proves that. History proves that exactly the case. Do you know a Babylonian? Do you know an Assyrian? They're gone. They touched Israel. This confederacy has got it coming. So let's just have a look and see what happens. Verse, verse 18, it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. And there's going to be as a result of that an earthquake like we've never seen before. Every wall shall fall to the ground. Verse 21, sword. Verse 22, pestilence, blood, rain, Overflowing rain, hailstones, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Job 38 says there's something in hail that is reserved for that day of judgment. Friends, that will not be a day to be on the wrong side of the judgments of God. And the result is God himself will be magnified in the earth. So that's what's going to happen when they touch Israel. Okay, so we're going to have a look at the allies of Russia, the future movements of Russia, and God's response. We'll look at that in more detail when we get to it. All right, where is Russia mentioned in the Bible? Let's come to Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 1 and 2, and we'll just see how the prophet introduces this chapter. You see, and we read, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Well, friends, if you take the King James Version, this is one of the occasions where the King James Version is a little lacking. And no version is perfect. They are the work of men looking at the inspired original Hebrew of the word of God. But what we have here, friends, in, in verse 2 is in actual fact a mention of Russia. And that word chief is in actual fact a proper noun. And it should be, should be translated as a proper noun. Rotherham, the Septuagint, the New American Standard Bible, the New King James Version, and I could list many others, translate that word chief as the word Rosh. So it's the Prince of Rosh. And so here is, in fact, we believe, a reference to Russia. But before we go and, and, and consult our historians to find out who Rosh is, to clearly identify it as Russia, we want to say a little word about this word Gog. So he says, set thy face against Gog. Now Gog means the one at the top. That's what it means in the, in the Hebrew. And it refers to a dominant ruler who will be ruling over this, I'm going to use the term confederacy or company of nations that's going to be brought together, in Ezekiel, as Ezekiel 38 tells us. He's a dominant ruler. Now, friends, in Russia, there is, at the moment, a dominant ruler. Now, we know not whether he is the Gog of Ezekiel chapter 38, but what we are seeing is the development of a presidential position that is dominant. We were just reading on the way, my wife was reading to me on the way into the lecture about what's in store for you if you happen to be an opposition leader in Russia. It's not a very good time, let me tell you that. The current opposition leader, he had uh, acid thrown in his face. He's also in jail for embezzlement, which is actually a trumped up charge. And he wants to go overseas to get to get um, a treatment for the acid burn, which has made him almost blind. Well, he can get a passport, but he can't get out of the country. And he thinks that maybe the passport is actually for wrapping up his fish and chips. That's what he says. What do they give me a passport for, for to wrap up fish and chips? Well, do you see the point? Being an opposition leader in Russia is not compatible with a long life, and it's also... It's also, uh, and, and that's because the position of president has become a dominating position. And that has been the case for some years, and it's getting worse, isn't it? And that's what we expect, this one at the top, to be in control of this group of nations. And friends, what we're going to see is indeed that is the way in which it's going. 
Now, we want to have a look a bit more at this word Rosh. You see, Rosh, we are told, is the most ancient form by which Russia is known. And we will put before you four witnesses. We're told in the Bible that out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word should be established. Well, here's four. George Vanansky, in his book, The Origin of the Russias, and in 1953, he says the first time that Russia appears in print is in the 38th chapter of Ezekiel under the title of Rosh. The Encyclopedia Britannica says the name Russia is certainly der derived from Rossiya, from the Slavic Rus or Ross. In uh, Bokart, in his book Sacred Geography, says Ross is the most ancient form under which history makes mention of Russia. And Stanley, in his book, The Jewish Church, he says the name Rus or Hebrew Roas or Septuagint Ross, unfortunately translated in the English version, that is the King James version, the chief first appeared in Ezekiel 38 verse 2 and 39 verse 1, is the only name of a modern nation that appears in the Old Testament. So that's a very interesting point. So what we're seeing, friends, here is that here is Russia mentioned. And the, the, the ruler of that Russia is a dominant figure who's going, to, who's going to rule over this area and control or have a control over the nations that are going to be, we're going to read about in the, the, the rest of or the, the early chap verses of Ezekiel chapter 38. Now just to pick it up, where is this Rosh? Well, just cast your eyes down to Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 15. All right. In Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 15, we're told, and, and the, the prophet is speaking to Gog, the ruler of this Rosh, and he says to him, And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts. Can't get much further north than Russia. It doesn't, it, and it's not, uh, um, it, it, and so he's telling us that he's going to come from the north. Okay? In, in actual fact, um, there's a couple of translations that we've got there um, in, on the overhead. The Rotherhand tells us the remote parts of the north and the RSV, the uttermost parts of the north. Okay, chapter 39 and verse 2, which um, we're not specifically going to look at, also tells us that this Rosh is in the north. Okay, so here we've got Russia spoken of in the Bible. So we've established that this chapter, which is talking about the movements of this great company or confederacy of nations, is headed up by Gog, and his Russians, who are going to make war against, ultimately, the land of Israel. Now, what we're going to see, friends, is that there's a group of nations that Russia is going to gather to themselves to, to form a confederacy. And it's basically Europe. All right? It's going to also involve some areas of uh, northern Africa and some areas of uh, um, to the east of the land of Israel. But let's have a, let's have a, have a read of, of the nations that are that are mentioned here. All right, we've got in in Ezekiel chapter thirty eight and verse two. We've got the land of Magog, the uh, Rosh, the, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. Then we've got um, we've got in in verse five. We've got Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya. We've got in verse six Goma and the house of Tagama of the north quarters and all his bands. So we've got a group of nations there. Historians can give us information on all of these nations, but I've just done it a little bit, I've done it, set it out on a map there for you. Meshech, according to Gesenius and Bokart, refers to the Moscovites. It's that area around Moscow. Tubal, according to Gesenius, is the area of Tobolsky, so over to the east of Moscow, of, of uh, the eastern area of the, the land we know now as Russia. Magog is the area of central and eastern Europe, from the Danube to the Don, as it were. Josephus, Herodotus, and Gesenius give us that idea. Goma, today, as in right now today, is very interesting. 
because that's the area of Western Europe, west of the Rhine, particularly the area involving the area of France. And here we've got elections in France, and guess who's got their finger in the pie? We've just heard in the last day or two about the, the uh, hacking of the, um, of the uh, um, computers of one of the candidates for the election, the one that Russia just happens to not want elected. And they've hacked his particular um, his, his computer and put all his information over the internet. Now, what effect that will have remains to be seen. But the point is this, that Russia is having its finger in the pie in the areas which we believe and which we have, have been teaching for over 100 years will be part of that group of nations. We find it interesting, friends. It's a trend that's telling us that these things are starting to happen. Then we've got the area of Tagama, which is the nations from Armenia, eastward, extending between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, involving part of Turkey and so forth, all right? And directly east of the Caspian Sea. And you can consult Josephus and Jusenius, and there's others that, uh, that indicate that as well. The area of Persia, well, we'd know that today as Iran, wouldn't we? Um, it's perhaps a little bit bigger than that in scriptural times because, in actual fact, um, in the book of Esther, we're told that Persia went from India to Ethiopia. So it's that area of Pakistan, of, uh, of uh, Iran, of Iraq. Okay? And what we're seeing, friends, is those areas are going away from the west and going towards Russia. Iran has been for a while. Iraq, with all the help that America gave them, are they pro-America? They're not. All right? And that's because Scripture has told us where they're going. And so that's very interesting, is it not, friends? And it's very interesting as well that there's actually a divide between what was once one country, India and Pakistan. There's a divide. Why is there a divide? Because that area of Pakistan is, would appear to be more on the Russian side. Okay? from the, uh, the area spoken of in the area of Persia. There's Ethiopia. We could say that's modern Ethiopia in the, in the area of northern Africa, maybe heading into Sudan as well. And the interesting thing about that, they're pro-Russian, aren't they? Then there's Libya. Well, Libya, part of the Arab Spring, had a very, a very uh, had a uh, um, Colonel Gaddafi got overthrown a few years ago. All right. Last, it's about five years ago now, he got overthrown. What happened? America came to their aid. I remember talking to a friend from work, a colleague from work. He was asking about what's going on. I said, mark my words, Libya will not go friends with America. Who's their friends today? Their friends are more Russian. And so what we're seeing, friends, is, is these things are starting to head in the direction that we expect them to do. Now, I want to make a point at this point, a very interesting point, and I can, I can prove this to you afterwards, but I, is, is this. Ezekiel 38 tells us about what's going to happen when Russia comes down upon the mountains of Israel. Now, when that happens, friends, the Lord Jesus Christ will have returned probably close to 10 years before. So for us to find a place in the kingdom of God, the opportunity will have passed 10 years before when Russia comes down against Israel. When this confederacy makes its way down into the land of Israel, it'll be 10 years too late. That's an important point to bear in mind. Don't wait for it to happen. We need to do something about it now. And God's very wise in that because he knows we're last minute people, aren't, doesn't he? He doesn't want us to wait and say, well, I'll wait till it's going to happen and then I'll do something about it. That's how the business world works. That's how your schools work. But it's not how God works. God wants people to worship and serve him because they love him, because they understand his purpose and they want to obey him, not because they're last-minute people. And so God has given us these things and us seeing them beginning to come to pass is very, very encouraging because we are seeing the prophecies of Almighty God 
being fulfilled, it's telling us that the Lord Jesus Christ could return at any time. Now, what am I, I want to have a look at, at a key word that occurs in this chapter. Because what it's going to tell us is this is the nature of the sort of alliance that Russia is going to make with Europe. You see, the word occurs in verse 4, it's the word company. It occurs again in verse 7, it's the word company. And a closely related word, I think, is the word assembled. It occurs again in verse 13, it's the word company. And it occurs again in verse 15, the word company. Now it's interesting, if you look that word out up, it is the Hebrew word quahal. In actual fact, in the, in, the, uh, in the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament, it's called a synagogue. It's a religious term. And what we're being told, friends, is here is a religious alliance. And that's very interesting because... In actual fact, we could go and do this same lecture based out of Daniel chapter 2. And we could show you how that the legs of iron can, the, and the iron of the legs continued into the feet, part of iron and part of clay. So something from the Roman Empire continues into the feet. We've got the continuation of the Catholic system. And isn't it interesting, friends, that Mr. Putin... Is very interested in the Pope. And isn't it interesting that we're getting these movements of unity between the Catholic system and the Russian Orthodox system? Metropolitan Kirill, the, the leader of the, of the Russian Orthodox system, has, begun, has, has met with the Pope several times now. And these moves started to take off, particularly since about 1991, with the fall of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union obviously was atheistic. And all of a sudden, the religion returned and we're getting the coming together of these religious systems. Now, we know not how close they will come, but what we're seeing is an alliance, a bringing together of two systems. Now, another very interesting point that we, that we could make is that there were two legs to the Roman Empire, were there not? There was one leg in Rome, there was another leg in Constantinople. 1453, the, the, the uh, Constantinople fell. And if you have a look at your National Geographic, it tells you what happened. Basically, the ruling emblems of that system were taken to none other than Moscow. And so the, you know, the, uh, the National Geographic from the early 1980s tells us that there are three Romes. Rome. Constantinople, and Moscow. And there we've got the second leg of that empire, as, as it were, moved to Moscow. And so we're once again seeing the continuation of that system. Now that was Daniel chapter 2. I wasn't going to talk about Daniel chapter 2, but somehow we got there. All right, let's have a look and, and see what's going to happen with this confederacy of nations in Ezekiel chapter 38. We want to come to verse 8. We're told in verse 8, so we've seen that group of nations that are going to be gathered together. All right? We're not actually told how they join up, how they become together, but we've just got this idea that it's a religious-based alliance. And we're told in verse 8 that after many days thou shalt be visited, and in the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. And so what we're seeing is the prophet is telling Gog that after many days, from the times of Ezekiel 38, Gog would come against the land of Israel after the land of Israel had been brought back from the sword after it had been recolonized as the nation of Israel. So those are very interesting things, friends, because many of us, or some of us, actually have lived through that thing. It was actually 69 years ago. Um, Isaiah 90 verse 4 tells us that's a lifetime. So if 
It's a lifetime ago, as it were. It might seem like a long time ago, but um, we'll have a look and see what Joel 3 has to say about that in a moment. But what we're told is that uh, thou shalt be visited in the latter years. And we're living in that period of time, the latter days. It's a time period that's spoken of in the Bible. Just to give you a bit of context, it is in the latter days that the kingdom of God will be established. We are told that in Isaiah chapter 2. So we're living, it's the time period in which the kingdom of God is going to be established that we're told of in verse 8. It's in the latter days. They're going to come against that land. So Gog is going to be visited, or as, the, as Rotherham renders it, thou shalt muster thy forces. You'll be summoned as the New American Stand Bible says. He's going to come down. He's going to gather together his forces to go and wage war in the land of Israel. That's his, that's his aim. That's where he's going. And as we said, that must be after 1948 because in 1948 the nation of Israel was re-established. Let's actually have a look at this because uh, a parallel passage is actually in Joel chapter 3. Keep your hand there. In, in Ezekiel 38, and just come forward a few chapters, a few books rather, to um, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. To the book of Joel, in Joel chapter 3. Now have a look in Joel chapter 3 uh, and verse 1 and 2, because Joel chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, tell us that in actual fact, this is very, we are living in these very significant times in relation to this. Verse 1, for behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. God says that at that time, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. So he says, all right, when I bring again the captivity of Judah... 1948, 69 years ago, almost a lifetime. And Jerusalem, 1967, almost 50 years ago, almost exactly 50 years ago, about a month short. Then when I do that, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. And he goes and he talks about that war that's going to take place in, on verse 9 on. Okay? It's going to be a war. It's actually picks up the, it's actually the terminology that's picked up in Revelation chapter 16 for the word Armageddon. The word Armageddon signifies a heap of sheaves in a valley for judgment. If you follow that idea through in, a, in, a, in Joel chapter 3, you will see. It's exactly the idea that's spoken of. Is the nations gathered like a, a, a pile of sheaves to be threshed or judged. That's exactly the idea that's given there. What we're seeing, friends, is that we are living in that time period. Now, the other thing that's very interesting, friends, is this. 1948, the nation of Israel was formed. In 1943, did it look like the nation of Israel was going to be formed? Or did it look like Hitler was going to destroy them? Or maybe 1942 or 41. That's only five, six, seven years before. See the point, friends? And that was when things moved a lot slower than they do now. It mightn't look like it today, but if Christ returns ten years before Ezekiel 38 takes place. How much time have we got? We don't know the answer. The point is, friends, that it's very interesting. We could do the same with 1967, could we not? 1967 came. In actual fact, in the early months of 1967, the world was worried whether Israel would be destroyed in actual fact, the Arabs were so confident of destroying them that I know of people who visited, who had people who were living on the Mount of Olives 
told them to move out for a few months. When they come back, they'll give them more land. They never returned. That's literally what happened. What we're seeing, friends, is that things don't have to look exactly like it for it to happen. What we saw with Brexit was the world was convinced that the Remain was going to win and that, it, that Britain would remain in the European Union. The election changed that in a day. It wasn't a day, it was about two hours. Very significant, because the Most High God rules in the kingdoms of men. The reason we point that out, friends, is come back to Ezekiel chapter 38, and let's have a look what it says in verse 9. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm, and thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and the many people that are with thee. It's suggestive, friends, of a sudden and violent invasion. It doesn't have to look like it's going to happen today. But friends, we are blessed to see that it's very significant things are happening in the world in which we live. Well, what's Gog's plan going to be? We have that from verses 8 to 12. All right. We're told in verse, uh, verse 4, verse 7, verse 12, and verse 15, where we looked at that idea of the, of the company, of the assembly. We saw there's a religious idea, so there, there's a religious reason. We saw that there's a, the, the Russian Catholic alliance, the, Rus the, the Catholic Europe with Russia. And so there's a religious reason. And there's holy sites in Jerusalem, which are very significant sites for all the four main religions of the world. And Russia is one of those who has a great interest in that. In actual fact, Russia is a very big landowner in the, nation, in, the land, in the city of Jerusalem. The Catholic Church has a great interest in Jerusalem. It's one of their holy sites, is it not? And so we can see very clearly a religious reason why Russia would want to become involved. We're told that he will we will think an evil thought. And we suggest that that's probably because of the anti-Semitic tendencies of those who hate Israel. And it's always been the case that that is the case. We're told in verse 12 that they will come to take a spoil, to take a prey. There's ambition to obtain wealth to seize spoil and to carry off plunder as the RSV has, to carry away silver and gold, to obtain wealth, to obtain prosperity. There's greed involved here. And so there we get the reasons why Russia is going to invade. But friends, Russia won't have it all their own way. And the Bible tells us about those nations who will oppose Russia on that occasion. And those, those nations are spoken of in verse 13, and we're told they are Sheba and Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, with the young lions thereof. And they shall say unto thee, they're going to give a, a weak protest, they shall say unto thee, art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take great, a great spoil? So what are you doing this for? We thought that you were friendly. We thought that you were not like this. And here they are, protesting. Who are Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof? Well, it's not the subject of our lecture this evening, but they basically are Britain and their allies. You see, let's read very carefully what that, of what this is. It's the merchants of Tarshish. It's a merchant power. And it has a whole lot of young lions, a whole lot of progeny. And there's a very interesting little cartoon that was in, uh, put up in, uh, I can't remember if it was World War I or World War II. The old mother lion, Tarshish, is calling the young lions, Australia, India, Canada, all the Commonwealth nations. And there's Britain and her Commonwealth nations who are there with the areas of uh, in, in, with, with those of the areas of Saudi Arabia and down in the, 
the, uh, the Arabian Peninsula there. There's Sheba and Dedan are spoken of there. And they're going to oppose Russia as they make their move. So what it indicates to us, friends, is that in these verses we're told, Art thou come to take a spoil? And it indicates the presence of British forces in that area at that time. I want to come just very briefly to Daniel chapter 11 because we're going to have a look in a little bit more detail very quickly at how Russia is going to make their move. Because really what we're told in Ezekiel 38 is they're going to come down into the land of Israel. There's a little more detail than that involved in Daniel chapter 11. What I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to this very briefly and tell you that God willing, on the 25th of June, God willing, we will cover that subject. We've put up on the overhead a, a little map, which gives us a couple of phases, divides the uh, Russia's invasion into a couple of phases. We're going to just very quickly cover Ezekiel, uh, Daniel chapter 11 from verse 40 to the end of the chapter, very quickly, just to see what Russia, how Russia is going to make their way down into the land of Israel. All right, let's just have a look in Ezekiel in Daniel chapter 11 and verse 40. We're told that at the time of the end, the king of the south shall push at him. So this is actually Daniel chapter 11 talks about two kings, two ruling powers. There's one in the south, that's south of Israel. There's one in the north, north of Israel. The south, king of the south was the ruling power in Egypt. The king in the north was, in actual fact, the Seleucid Empire. Very significant, friends. It includes Syria. The Seleucid Empire includes Syria. If you look at it on a map, just look it up. Okay. What we're told, friends, is that the king of the south would push at him. Now, him is another power, and I can show you afterwards why. It's actually the power ruling in Constantinople. The king of the south in World War I was, in actual fact, the, na the nation that ruled over, over Egypt. It was Britain. They pushed the Turkish Empire, ruling in Constantinople, out of the land of Israel. History tells us that's exactly what happened. They pushed them out as they dried up, a Bible term, the Euphrates Empire or the Turkish Empire. So they pushed them out. And then we told, we, we had said that following that, there's this colon in the middle of verse, or the early part of verse 40. And that's telling us there's a gap. Because then what's going to happen is the king of the north is going to come against the ruler in Constantinople like a whirlwind. And by putting this chapter together with Ezekiel 38, we believe that that will have to be Russia. But Russia needs to take Syria to become the king of the north. And so what we expect to see is Russia to take control of that old Seleucid Empire, particularly the area of Syria. Eastern Turkey, perhaps, and uh, and heading uh, further further east beyond Syria into the area of Iraq. And then what we're going to see, friends, is that Russia is going to take the him, that is Constantinople. Then, in verses forty one and forty two, we see how Russia is going to sweep their way down through the land. All right. Verse 41, he shall enter into the glorious land, the land of Israel. Many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and chief of the children of, Adam, Am, of Ammon. So as he makes his way down through the land of Israel, the, nation, the area on the east of Jordan is going to escape. And that would appear because Britain is actually in that area. So they make their way down. And where do they go? Well, they go from there down Verse 42, he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. So he goes down into Egypt. When he gets down into Egypt, he takes control of Egypt. He's got a score to settle with Egypt. That's a subject for another time. And then we're told, um, verse 43, but he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians will be right there to help him. Isn't that what we saw in Ezekiel 38? Libyans and Ethiopians are going to be with Russia. 
There they are. Here they are in Daniel chapter 11. But, verse 44, tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and to utterly make away many. There's this, this storm that all of a sudden brews and off he goes. And where's he going? He shall plant the tabernacle of his palaces between the seas, between the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean, right there in the land of Israel in Jerusalem. There he's going to set himself up in the glorious holy mountain. But Daniel finishes it very quickly. He says, yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. So there's a basic outline of those movements that Russia's going to make. That's Russia's future foretold by the Bible, very briefly. But let's come back to Ezekiel chapter 38. Let's have a look. And in actual fact, we do get a hint that Russia is going to come up into the land of Israel. Because Russia, as we're told in Ezekiel 38, came from his place in the north, doesn't he? We're told, Ezekiel 38, it was in the north. Verse 15. But what does verse 16 say? And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days. You see, uh, uh, um, Joel chapter 3 told us when these latter days are, didn't it? When I bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. In the latter days I will bring thee against my land. And so here is Russia coming against the land of Israel. Now we want to come back to, uh, to uh, um, verse 14. And we want to pick up a point here in verse 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto go, Thus saith the Lord God, in that day when my people of Israel dwell safely, Shalt thou not know it? You see, what we're being told here is that here are the nation of Israel. They are, in fact, God's people. And God destroyed Egypt because they afflicted his people. God destroyed Babylon because they afflicted his people. And all down through history, the afflictors of Israel, as we said, have been destroyed. It was actually part of a promise to Abraham. I will curse him that curseth thee. And now these people have come against my people of Israel. We're told there that they would dwell safely, and the idea is confidently, and that's indeed how the nation of Israel dwells. They dwell confidently, confident in their own abilities, are they not? But not only that, it's not only God's people, it's God's land. And God said that... The land was not to be sold. He says that in Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 23. He said the land is not to be sold. We read in Joel chapter 3, did we not, that part of the reason that God's going to judge the nations when he gathers all nations to the valley of Jehoshaphat is because they've parted my land. They've unlawfully taken parts of my land and given it to people to whom it does not belong. That's what God's saying. And there he is. He's going to judge them for what they have chosen to, done, to do. So therefore, as a result, and we picked up these ideas in the beginning of our lecture this evening, in verse, verse 18, where we're told, And it shall come to pass at the same time, when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. You see, here's God's response to their open rebellion to his laws, to the destruction of his people, to the fighting over and the parting of his land. His fury will come up in his face. We, speak, we, we spoke before about that great earthquake that's going to take place. Let's just very carefully, quickly pick up in verse 20 the significance of that earthquake. We're told in verse, in verse 20 that uh, the significance of that earthquake, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven 
and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall. In actual fact, that word, that word refers to multi-story buildings. And every wall shall fall to the ground. So there's a massive destruction that's going to take place as a result of that. And where is that going to be centred? Well, of course it's going to be centred at the very area where Gog has established himself right there in Jerusalem. So what do you think it's going to do to all the churches and abominations that are centred in Jerusalem? It's going to turn them all upside down and destroy them. There's going to be massive changes that are going to take place in that land. You see, it's very interesting. There's the centre of that earthquake. Just keep his hand in Ezekiel 38. And let's come to Isaiah chapter 2. And let's see what's going to be placed in that very place as a result of the Lord Jesus Christ's return to the earth and the, and, and the judgment of the nations and the establishment of the kingdom of God. Isaiah chapter 2. You see, here is God. He's going to destroy all the religious aspirations of the world. It's going to make way for a beautiful temple that God's going to set up in Jerusalem from where his laws are going to be dispensed throughout all the world. Let's have a look at that in, in, in Isaiah chapter 2. And shall come to pass when? In the last days. Same time, friends. Same time as Ezekiel 38. Same time period. It's taking place after the judgments that take place upon Go in the land of Israel. That the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. How is it going to be established in the top of the mountains? How is this mountain... Well, in actual fact, it's called Mount Zion. If you ever looked at a map of Jerusalem, Mount Zion is barely more than a mound. Here we're told it's going to be established in the top of the mountain. It's going to be pushed up. In actual fact, Zechariah 14 says that there's going to be a plain from Geba to Rimmon, an area of about from here right down to um, a little bit past Mandra. It's going to be a plain. In the middle of that, this mountain, mountain is going to be established. And, out of that, and around that mountain is going to be built a massive temple, about a mile square, as Ezekiel, the last few chapters of Ezekiel tell us. But what's going to happen? All nations are going to flow unto it at the end of that verse 2. Where they come and they'll learn to, of God and of his ways. And they'll be interested, finally, in walking in those ways. Because up till now, man's rejected the ways of God. So, friends. That leaves us with, well, let's come back to uh, um, Ezekiel chapter 38 very briefly and let's pick up the destruction of Gog. Because as we said, the curses of Israel don't get away with it lightly. And that's probably an understatement. As we saw at the beginning of the lecture, there's a whole list of things that God's going to do to judge those people that come against the nation of Israel. We're told in, in, in a parallel passage, you might like to make a, lo a note of Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 to 5. Another summary of the same events. All nations gathered against Jerusalem. The appearance of Almighty God in the middle of that great earthquake, destruction. Almighty God is exalted. Summary of uh, Zechariah chapter 14, the first five or eight verses, it might be the first eight verses in actual fact. But what we have in Ezekiel 38 verses 21 and 22 is judgment on the invader. God will call for a sword against him. What's going to happen? Every man's sword will be against his brother. Now that's interesting because that's happened before, hasn't it? Gideon when Gideon overthrew with 300 men, the 145,000 Midianites, you see, it's very interesting. It's not hard to 
work out how that's going to happen. Just cast your eyes back to the early verses of this chapter and have a look. You've got Russians. You've got Germans. You've got French. You've got Persians. You've got so Iranians, Iraqis, Ethiopians, Libyans. All those countries in the, in the satellite state, all the old satellite states of the Soviet Union, they all speak different languages. They're all going to be part of this army. All of a sudden, things go bad. They'll all speak their own language. Every man for himself, destroying one another. That's what's going to happen. Verse 22, I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood and will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Takes us back to the times of Joshua, doesn't it? When the sun stood still, God destroyed a confederacy of nations with a religious overtone, with hailstones. Very interesting, isn't it? The result is thus, I will magnify myself and I will be known in the eyes of many nations and they shall know that I am the Lord. You see, God's going to be magnified amongst the nations. He's going to become great and important. He's going to be sanctified. He's going to be set apart, hallowed and consecrated, put in his rightful position. The world today rejects God and everything he stands for. In that day, by these judgments, the rejectors of God will be brought to acknowledge that by their destruction. Now, friends, we have a choice. We can throw our lot in with Russia, or we might want to throw our lot in with Britain. Or we could choose to throw our lot in with the Lord Jesus Christ and be a part of those who will bring about these judgments and who will establish the kingdom of God and teach the world the laws and the ways of God. And if we want to do that, well, we need to come to know God now. And that's the point, friends, is it not? That God is going to be sanctified and known in all the world. We can choose to do it now, the easy way, or it will happen on our destruction, the hard way. You see, friends, it's happened in the past when God educated the nation of Israel as he brought them through the wilderness with the plagues in Egypt and his name was magnified and they come to know Yahweh and to trust him, almighty God, and to trust him. And it's going to happen again with the nation of Israel in the future. The Lord Jesus Christ says, this is life eternal, to know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. You see, friends, that's the outcome of coming to know God truly. It's life eternal. Or else we can choose to do it the hard way, like the Egyptians did. And you can read about the stubbornness of Pharaoh if you go through the early chapters of Exodus, and you can see why they were destroyed, because they wouldn't accept the power of God. Or we can join ourselves with Gog and his allies and be destroyed with them. Or we can take the wise words of the Lord Jesus Christ and come to know God and Jesus Christ. Whom he has sent. What is it to know God? Well, it's to know his character, to know what he's like, because God desires us to emulate that character in our life. To come to know his purpose. What is God's purpose? Well, God said, Truly I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of God. That's what he said in Numbers chapter 14 and verse 21, to fill this earth with his glory. That is people who show forth his character. And how will that be manifested or revealed in people? Friends, that's by developing that in our lives. And we've got, if we want to know, if we, we, we want to be like that, well, we've got to know what it's all about. And that's reading, studying, thinking about the Word of God. We've got to know the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what was said in John chapter 17. We've got to know his character. It just happens to be 
exactly like God. He's a manifestation or a, or a revealing of the character of God. We need to understand his purpose, his role in the purpose of God. There is salvation in no other. There's no other name through which we can gain salvation but through identification by baptism with the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. How can we gain salvation? I want to end with the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in Mark chapter 16, where he tells his disciples to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. See, we have a choice, friends. We can throw in our lot with the Lord Jesus Christ. We can identify with his saving name through baptism to find a place in the kingdom of God, to be a part of that glorious kingdom when all nations will flow to Jerusalem to learn of God and of his ways. Or we can choose to be a part of a world that's heading towards the judgments of God and the destruction that's going to take place. We thank you for your time.